Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 820. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 8th, 2023. All right, thank you again for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is George and I's happy place. We get to sit down and talk about the stories we find on the internet and around the world that interest us and assume you'll be interested as well because um, this this is Anglican, this is Christian, and this is just the kind of culture we're fighting right now. And there's a lot of stuff happening out there. George, how are you doing this week? Well, I'm in a little bit of pain right now. Uh, not Nothing's nothing major, but... Uh... This is the wet season in Florida, and so I'm preparing our lawn to put down new sod in certain spots where it's all sort of bare and grizzly. And I had a choice of uh, putting a weed a killer grass killer on, letting it sit for two weeks. Or grass could, killer or a weed killer? Both. But well, actually, there's no grass there; it's all weed. Uh, <laughs> okay. But basically, take it down to the bare dirt, and then uh, you'll know, have to let it sit for a week or two. But with, uh, we've got a lot of little dogs in our house, and uh, I can just see them deciding, oh, doesn't this taste nice? So I decided to uh, get out my uh, torch and burn the dead grass off. Well, it really was fun to do until a gust of wind came, set my pants on fire, and uh, I have no hair on my uh, left uh, calf now. Uh, it's all singedy and everything. Was George stripping off his pants, running back to the house? No, I was rolling in the dirt, you know, <laughs> patting it, and the dogs were barking at me. And uh, and uh, uh-huh. uh, you know, I, Susan came in and said, "What happened to you? What'd you do with your pants?" <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but you know, I I love playing with blo- settling torches. I like to weld. I love to basically play with fire. And whatever I can, I'm a I'm a perpetual eight year old as it comes to uh, burning things. So, oh no, I, I remember early in my marriage, we were renting a house in Huntsville, Alabama, and my dear wife, who was proud of her husband's uh, skill, said, "Why don't you go in back and and build a uh, fire for our our chicken, and we'll we'll have barbecue tonight?" I said, "Sure." Never have used this barbecue grill before. And I turned on the propane and closed the cover, and I kept hitting that little red switch. It never ignited. Finally, I went into the kitchen. The whole time, this this little barbecue is filling with propane. Got a match, came out, stuck the match in, and boom. No eyebrows. No, well, I probably look like I do now, <laughs> except no, no facial hair. It just blew everything off. And oh, yep, uh, men and fire is comedy central. You know, we, we will always do something to uh, to have fun with the fire, but it, it gets us every time. George, we uh, had a great episode last week. Uh, we talked about many different topics, and I guess we're going to do the same this week. And I wanted to start off uh, doing a follow-up on the Pope Francis stuff we talked about. Uh, you sent me some story ideas, and your title is Pope Francis Becoming a Second Joe Biden. And uh, it's a good question because... <sighs> The, the role of a pope is to be a magistrate over the church, uh, continue the doctrine, uh, uh, baptize the babies, kiss the kids, uh, pray for the, the uh, those who need to be healed. Um, it's a central role, but in the 21st century, it plays a bigger role. And uh, I can think of many popes throughout history who've stepped outside of the role that they were supposed to play as a pope. And I see that here with Pope Francis. He's, he's, he's gone beyond the role of a magisterium into a political commentator, into an economics commentator, um, which you, you can clearly see he's outclassed. He does, he does, it's not his, his, his specialty, George. Well, I, I said Joe Biden, not because of U.S. politics, but because I don't think he's all there. I, I know okay. it's offensive for me to say that, but the Vicar of Christ has had a really bad week, two weeks. We talked a little bit last week about how at the uh, World Youth uh, Day in Portugal, Francis praised 
that great imperial Russia and its noble culture and its humanity. And of course, the Ukrainian Catholics who were forcibly made Orthodox by Catherine the Great uh, have blown a gasket saying, you know, what are you talking about, Francis? Pointing out that great imperial Russia today under Vladimir Putin, the new czar, is trying to take over their world. Uh, Francis went to Mongolia. Wonderful thing. You know, small Christian community just starting out. But then he lauded, Francis lauded Genghis Khan's blood-soaked empire for its religious tolerance and the Pax Mongolica. And that happened because Genghis Khan killed 40 million people. Uh, then he encouraged, uh, Francis encouraged at the same time, Chinese Christians to be good citizens of a nation whose culture he greatly admired and whose government, he says, is, quote, very respectful towards the church. And I think there might be some disagreements on the <laughs> communist attitude towards the church in China, but hey, let's not stop there. In Nicaragua, a bishop was sentenced to 26 years in prison for opposing the Ortega regime for treason. The Jesuit university was shut down and the church is being actively persecuted. And Francis refuses to say anything. In Germany, the Archbishop of Berlin has says, said that, uh, you sent this to me, that uh, priests who marry gay couples or bless gay unions, he's not going to intervene. And Francis is letting that slide. And then, of course, we talked about the deplorables in the United States. The American conservatives were worried that the synod is, is going to be politicized. Uh, and that they're embracing a rigid and empty ideologies instead of following the living doctrine of the faith. If Francis has gone out of his way to deliberately provoke conservatives or traditionalists, I don't think there are any buttons he hasn't pushed uh, this week. Well, that's um, just missing well is did. women priests. Uh, I mean, the only thing that really is missing is women priests, but yeah. you know, every other button is pushed here this last week i don't think you can go around growing the church or uh using subtle doctrine by attacking economies around the world and promote promoting you know governments who over the last 120 years have offed a hundred million of their citizens one of the first books i read in um, second or third year of high school was uh, the gulag archipelago you know, describing the early Soviet Union and how it came to to, to power. It's a, it's a three-book series. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of formed my early understanding of what an empire is and how evil it can be and how it does not care one bit about its citizens, but it does care about the party. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if in his upbringing he has an understanding of world history or the soviet history or certainly the chinese history uh which was for all intents and purposes murderous it had nothing to do and had no love of its citizens and i mean francis was uh was an archbishop and i think he was a bishop or an archbishop in argentina during the bad times of the military junta where clergy and people were arrested and disappeared and stuff mm -hmm. So he's had personal experience of authoritarian evil regimes. And plus he grew up in the Peron era where yeah. uh, of the strongmen. And to laud strongmen in China and Genghis Khan and Catherine the Great, I don't know, maybe that's why I say it seems more like it. I can't I don't get angry at Joe Biden anymore because it really for me it's like it's an it's he, he's so ill it's it, yeah no and it, that's true you it, know it, it's, it's almost unfair i mean i'm more angry mm -hmm. with biden's handlers and his wife for abusing yeah. the elderly and sometimes i think francis is the creature of a group around him uh well i don't know because th this is what he knows he knows south america socialism he knows, um, you know, uh, communism wannabes. 
uh, from from that part of the country. And so this this his education did not involve an education of understanding capitalism, which is a hor a horrible economic uh, plan. Yet it's the best we got. Uh, it's lifted millions, if not billions, out of poverty. Um, yes, it's it, it, it's monstrous, but a, a, around the world, it's the best economy you can have. Well, the yeah, Francis is in the Catholic worldview the vicar of Christ, mm -hmm. and that comes with certain obligations and responsibilities to speak prudently and prudentially, and yeah. not to be a partisan. You know. We have a story further down our list about Justin Welby's latest inanity. Does it does it shake my faith? Does it make me question being an Anglican or an Episcopalian because Justin Welby says something stupid? Of course not, because Justin Welby isn't a pope. He's just the Archbishop of Canterbury and the first among equal for the time being. Uh, that's going to change with the uh, Global South uh, in the next year or so. But. I'm not a Roman Catholic, but I admire the Catholic Church, its rigor, its uh, historicity, it's so much of it. I don't accept some Catholic doctrines, therefore I can't be a Catholic. Yeah. Uh, but I admire it, and I just, you know, it's like, it's like you see a beautiful car, uh, it's not yours, but somebody's like smashed in the bumper and it's got a big scratch on the side, you think, you know, why would you allow that to happen to such a beautiful instrument? Um, that that analogy may not work for everybody, but it certainly works for me. <laughs> well, at this point, it's a car up on stilts. Somebody stole the wheels, and it's not able to operate its design to do. Uh, we the fame of Anglican and scripted is we comment on a broken church, and it, it's a broken a broken church globally in all denominations. You know, it, we, we, we need to get our mojo back as a church. And it's it's happening in some small provinces here around the world, but it's going to take a long time because we've given up our fight with culture. We don't mm -hmm. think culture is the enemy anymore. We think culture is something that can enhance the church. And it <laughs> does not work. All right, enough for story number one. Let's move on to story number two. We're going to skip that one. We'll do that one on Tuesday. We'll get more information. Um, we discussed last week that there's a bishop under investigation uh, because he groped a uh, female uh, who happened to be president of the House of Deputies. This is an accusation. Uh, we now know who has been accused, George. Julia Ayala Harris, who is from the Diocese of Oklahoma, was elected president of the House of Deputies at the last general convention. Mm -hmm. After her election, she was hugged by a retired bishop, and she has accused this bishop of touching her inappropriately in that hug. And she filed a Title IV complaint, and the investigation was held, and the recommendation was that uh, this is a he said, she said, so let's deal with this pastorally because sure. we really, you know, we cannot find any sexual intent here. Maybe he just didn't know, you know, this didn't rise to the level of a trial. Well, when she got this ruling, she went bananas and she put a, la a letter to the deputies of the Episcopal Church, essentially saying, you know, starting the Me Too movement in the hierarchy of the Episcopal Church. Believe all women. She didn't like the outcome. She wants justice. And she said, I'm not going to name this bishop because I'm afraid for my life, which I thought was, you know, quite something. And then uh, the Episcopal News Service and the Living Church magazine were able to winnow out that it was Ed Kanishi, uh, the retired bishop of Oklahoma, a man with whom she's had a 15 year relationship in the Diocese of Oklahoma. So, Kanishi has been suspended from all ministerial activities. Uh, he's retired, but he's been involved in commissions and committees. He's, he's the head of the parole board in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, he's a retired LA policeman um, before he became a priest. And I, and, and then, 
the women bishops of the House of Bishops got together and sort of had got this Me Too letter going that we need to believe and take things seriously. And the rest of the bishops of the Episcopal Church sort of hopped on saying, yeah, yeah, let's I'll sign it to believe all women. Michael Curry gave a little video saying, believe all women, but I'm going to recuse myself from all of this because I don't want to get involved. Uh, and it's just, as I said last time, um, the Me Too movement of this woman, Julia Harris, you know, they have a legal investigatory system. And she's saying that the system didn't work in her case, and therefore she wants to junk the system because she wants a predetermined outcome. Mm -hmm. So she wants to be victim, prosecutor, and judge in this system. Well, but we live in a, a, a completely different reality than we did 100 years ago because we redefined everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, right now, in uh, public, public uh, parlance, everything is racism. Mm -hmm. Okay, every outcome that you look at is achieved because there was racism involved somewhere. Mm -hmm. In the public par parlance of uh, sexual harassment, all women must be believed and all men are predators. That's just mm -hmm. a liberal thing. Now, here lie the problem. Some men are predators. Some mm -hmm. women are victims. Here at the University of Wisconsin last week, a woman was raped uh, uh, and it's caught on tape, and he, she encountered a predator. That predator uh, accosted her, and he's going to jail for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Thank God. The problem is when we re redefine things, we don't really know what the level is. If if all hugs are rape, um, yeah, and who's that famous uh, feminist who says all sex is rape, uh, we don't have good definitions anymore. And so we, we live in this muddled world because we've accepted culture's de uh, definitions. You know, we've accepted the world's definitions. And she may very well be a victim of somebody who groped her. But she took that to the system. And the system says we are uncomfortable with he said, she said polity. And we, we need more evidence. The, the, the Quran asked for more evidence. The Bible asked for more evidence. And he said, she said, I mean, you're going outside of uh, uh, historical norms to have somebody convicted. You know? the, my sympathies uh, lay with both people. The woman, the woman believes that she was sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be responded to pastorally. Uh, as well as uh, canonically and judicially. This bishop has been accused of a crime that is unbefitting a member of the clergy. Mm -hmm. They went through the system, and he needs to be responded past because he's, you know, his whole ministry is now basically being said, hey, you, you know, go away, pal, you're a pervert. And the church did its job and said, okay, how we resolve this is through pastoral means. And I feel badly for bishop, for the bishop because the victim in this case, the claimed victim, is not willing to resolve this pastorally. She wants, you know, to be believed and she wants her way and or no way. And I, the problem is the world can't work that way. Yeah. We have to make now. Now, I'm not saying that this should be the case in all cases, but from what I've read, uh, this really does seem to be a bit over the top. I mean, yeah, the Me Too but, movement with Jeffrey Epstein and, you know, being raped and couch, uh, casting couch, you know, you had to sleep with Epstein to get a job. We're not talking about that level. Uh, but here's the thing. Because there's a 15-year relationship, Maybe there was something later, uh, later, and now this woman's in a position of authority where she can make a complaint and she'll be listened to. I just don't know how to, to right. go forward with this. I, I'm of two and, minds, really. It's and, and that's where you, please listen to Kevin George here. We're not saying she's lying. We're not saying he's innocent. We're saying this is a difficult situation that was presented to uh, a, a forum that was set up to handle these types of situations. She was unhappy with the results of that, 
and is continuing uh, to, to seek justice, whatever that may be. Now, justice has, yeah, talk about redefinitions. Justice has been redefined. Justice used to be access to the system. Justice is now result, you know, and uh, it's one of those crazy stories. But uh, please, if, if you listen to this story and said, uh, Kevin and George think uh, she's she's lying and she's full of, no, 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 no. We're just saying that uh, this is a difficult situation because you're trying to take a he said, she said and make a court case out of it. It's very difficult to do. And largely, you could not do this in our legal parlance here in America, but you could do it in our civil parlance. It, it, you could make a civil case out of it, but not a legal case. Um, it, it, it's one of those things. Uh, so let's, uh, before we talk yeah. ourselves and into a the corner there, yeah. Is, and my thinking is, it, to begin with, this woman had the best possible venue the the upper reaches of the episcopal church are as pc as they get yeah. and they didn't find in her favor such that she was happy i mean come on now i mean she's starting you know the ball on the on the 40 yard line not the 50 yard line uh in her case and still no. they didn't find the way she wanted to yeah this isn't a no longer a good old boy network she was dealing with uh, yeah. th this is this is the uh, the good old uh, House of Bishops in, in the Episcopal Church network, which, yeah, <laughs> she she would have uh, it was tilted to her side. Justice Justice was not blind on this at all. But let's move on to our next story. It's about another Episcopal bishop from the Diocese of Eastern and Western Michigan. Now this is a strange one because I, it's not me too ish. It's um, ugly divorces and uh, i think we, we need to talk about it and once again george and i are not taking sides we're trying to present the story as factual we i have an opinion on this but i'll try and keep that out george prince singh uh, he's from india originally uh, was the bishop of rochester new york for many years he retired and then he became the interim or provisional bishop of eastern and western michigan two dioceses that are relatively small and poor, and so they split one part-time bishop uh, between them to make a full-time job. Singh has gotten divorced from his wife, and his wife and his two uh, young sons, who are in their 20s, have gone on to social media accusing their father of being abusive, uh, drinking, being mean. It's a nasty divorce. Uh, Singh, P bishop Singh has since remarried, uh, there's an Indian angle in that Singh is of a certain caste, and while his wife is from the Dalit or untouchable caste, and so they're saying that there's prejudice by the husband against his wife for being an untouchable and all that. Well, this has been out there for a few months, and in light of the uh, Harris business, the Me, the Me Too movement, uh, the Episcopal Church just this past week has decided to suspend Bishop Singh from all ministerial activities until a resolution of this case based on the accusations of his ex-wife and his sons. Now, um, I have no idea what's truth in this, but I am aware of cases where an outwardly wonderful father, bishop, you know, man, pillar of the community is a real SOB in the home and abusive to his wife and children. I'm also aware of cases where a divorce gets so angry and bitter that the ex-husband or ex-wife wants to destroy the other partner. Uh, I've seen it, uh, pastoral cases I'm aware of where, you know, false charges of abuse are labeled against a husband. So he loses all custody. A, in a joint custody agreement and yeah. he spends years fighting it and uh, the children get alienated from the father by the mother who keeps telling them what a bastard their father is and I have no idea what the truth is in this but to me it's just it just smells bad that uh, after having had Bishop Singh's problems out there f for so long when the Harris thing hits they've now got to basically jump on and oh yeah we're going to penalize uh, Bishop Singh too. Uh, 
You know, what's happened in the last two weeks that wasn't there the previous two weeks? So. News. <laughs> the news cycle. Absolutely. And I mean, that's the trouble with relationships here. It's, it's a broken world and you're going to find that in the world and you're going to find that in the church. Uh, and uh, this is this is just evidence of that. Um, and, and it's hard to watch, even though I'm not a fan of that diocese and um, what it's been doing. Uh, I take pity on this family, you know, and, and keep them in my prayers. We prayed for them in the show. You no, know, before divorce we did the show. is such a horrible, horrible thing. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it, it just destroys so much. Um, but oh my, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next. Can we jump here. down to Stuart Ruck just because it's sort of in the same sure. vein okay, yeah. of things? Um, we have heard from the tribunal that they are going to allow this to move forward and they have undone the stay. Now, uh, hey, I'm not an attorney. I don't speak legalese. Last, when we first did the Ruck story, I had to go through a legal dictionary to make sure I had all the terms right. George, what does this mean? There had been a stay of proceedings uh, in the Stuart Ruck case. Stuart mm -hmm. Ruck has been accused of conduct on becoming a member of the clergy. That's not been defined so that we don't know that he did this on that day. That hasn't right. been shared. But the thinking is this has to do with the uh, Mark Rivera and the uh, Resurrection Church in the Diocese of the Upper Midwest where Rivera was a lay leader who has been since convicted of raping uh, people in the congregation. And the allegations that we've heard so far that have been made public is that Ruck did not handle this appropriately and canonically. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the allegation. Sure. Yeah. Now, there were some legal machinations back and forth that at one point provoked a constitutional crisis within the ACNA between the authority of the tribunal and the archbishop's office. But all of that stuff has now been resolved and settled, and the tribunal has lifted all stays of proceeding based upon all the other legal proceedings. Uh, they've now all been resolved. So, this, so the Stuart Ruck case can now go to the tribunal for essentially trial. Uh, finding facts and adjudicating whether or not the bishop behaved properly or improperly. And we got to this point because uh, hidden in their canons where only a lawyer could find it was kind of a, a nuclear button, a nuclear option. You know, if you really don't want to go to trial, you know, bishop, all you have to do is push this button and, and you're free. And boom, uh, no, you know, he took that advice and uh, hit that button. In hindsight, I don't know. I probably wouldn't have done that, George. You know, it, it didn't look good. Um, but now the, the water is clear, the water is calm, and I think we can proceed procedurally through this. Yeah. We'll yeah. See. I mean, uh, sometimes legal advice makes sense in a legal world, but it is terrible in the regular world because, you know, um, pleading guilty to a lesser charge just to avoid the potential yeah. of a greater yeah. charge, even though you didn't do it. That happens in our legal system. People plead out because either they can't afford a decent attorney or mm -hmm. that's basically the best option they're given. Yeah. The, it, hey, instead of a felony, we'll give you a misdemeanor and you can walk and pay a $600 fine or we'll see you in court for 12 months. You know, mm -hmm. that that's a very common thing, uh, especially in the state just south of me in Illinois. Not the place to go to jail. All right, George, let's move on to some more stories here. Moving to the page. Uh, India, India, India. I know. Hold on, hold on. I, I, I skipped a whole bunch of things here, Michigan. Oh, because we went to Stuart Rock. Um, I think we, why don't we run over to uh, the Church of England here with uh, Mike Pilavachi. I know I'm not doing that perfectly. Uh, and the story there. Mike Pilavachi was the founder of Soul Survivor. He was a very charismatic with a small c, uh, minister, uh, youth leader, been involved in ministry for almost 40 years, over 20 of, almost 20 of them was an ordained priest of the Diocese of, uh, oh, was it Chel uh, St. Albans? Yes, Diocese of St. Albans. 
and he's based out of Watford. And he would hold these massive, massive youth type services and retreats and things. And over the last year, stories arose that he was manipulating and abusing young men, basically being a spiritual bully engaging in inappropriate semi-sexual relations of, you know, having your know, back massages and wrestling with young men and things you just shouldn't do. But also, but the major issue was that he was a spiritual manipulator and bully and that he basically controlled fragile young men and basically got turned them into little toadies and acolytes and whatnot. Well, the Church of England's National Safeguarding Team and the Diocese of St. Albans investigated this, found it to be true, and Pilavachi has resigned from the ministry and is basically gone. Didn't rise to the level of criminal conduct, but Pilavachi has resigned. A uh, sole survivor has uh, released a statement apologizing for his uh, abuses and noting that uh, Andy Croft, the uh, number two fellow there, who is all, is on, is still suspended pending an internal church investigation, not for misconduct of his own, but basically of keeping quiet over knowledge of misconduct by uh, Pilavachi. So I have to admit, I'd never heard of him before this story broke out. No. Uh, wasn't on any of my radar, and uh, but I've had... Uh, so many emails and comments from viewers in the UK saying, man, this is shocking and hard. I mean, my sons went to this and uh, my just it, it just it it really hits in a hard way that it's almost like, oh, my God, not this, too. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's strange because there's almost a common thread here. We had the, uh, Jonathan Fletcher. We've had the Hill songs. We've had all these uh, stories appear in the last uh, 10 years of people who were charismatic with a small C um, had built their own ministries and been found to have been with a sexual sin. And it's difficult to watch this because you and I grew up in the 80s. You know, the Jim and Tammy Bakers, the uh, Jimmy Swaggerts. And so we're kind of used to this corruption at a televangelist level. But here we see, you know, ministries that were clearly fruitful, that were clearly not uh, uh, there just for financial gain, where you're seeing sin still pervasive. It's And it's not just from a evangelical or capital C charismatic side. Yeah. Yeah. We saw this uh, with, uh, oh, who was that bishop? Uh, in the UK, that was a very charismatic, small C, Anglo-Catholic bishop, uh, uh, Bishop of Gloucester at the end. Uh, his name will come to me when we're done. Sure, that's right. Uh, who, who, who was a basically molested young men uh, in his, uh, his religious order uh, and actually went to prison for it. And I think the common thread isn't churchmanship. We can't say this is only Anglo-Catholics or only evangelicals or only charismatics or only liberals, anything like that. What we can basically, I think that the thread that goes through this is power. The power of, of unfettered power given to one, and in this case, all men, to uh, that is never challenged or never questioned. So that behaviors that people see that, oh, I don't know if that's right, because it's the big guy, we don't ask about it. We don't question it. We don't hold people accountable. And in essence, we're almost turning them into mini Christs or mini uh, idols. Yeah. And that and that was part of the problem with uh, Jonathan Fletcher. He was untouchable in the Church of England. He was, you know, the the man, and you couldn't uh, attack him. Now, certainly liberals attacked him for his church politics, but if you questioned him from being on the seat on from within the evangelical movement, you were betraying the team. If you attacked uh, this bishop, you were betraying the Anglo-Catholic team. If you were if you raise questions about Mike Pilavachi, you're destroying this wonderful, fruitful ministry that has brought so many young men and women to Christ. Um, 
And yet the same sin happens again and again and again. Works itself out a little differently in each case. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I mean, Fletcher didn't do anything that would send him to prison, whereas the bishop did. And Pilavachi isn't going to go to jail because, for, you know, wrestling. Uh, but it's all unfettered power, unquestioned power. People not putting themselves under the authority of Christ, but putting themselves under the authority of their minister, of the boss, of the big man. Yeah. I'm, and, you know, we... We see that, Kevin, do you remember when we reported on the adultery of the primate of Uganda, the ex-primate of Uganda at the time, and you and I, and who was our source? The current Archbishop of Uganda. He told us about it. Mm -hmm. And we reported this, and we were vilified by so many Africans. How dare you say anything bad about our Father and God? In other words... It's it's a, maybe it's a human phenomena that we don't want to imagine our leaders have feet of clay. We don't want to hold them accountable. Yeah, yeah we don't want to. And there's a difficulty that because you and I have a bias. Okay, I have an ACNA bias. We just did a story with, on Bishop Ruck. I'm a big fan. Uh, we do stories all the time with Bishop Foley. Big fan. You know, Calvin Robinson. I'm a big fan. Okay. And so we have these built-in biases, and so do nations with their leaderships and, and their clergy. Um, they have this built-in bias where he can do no wrong. And um, it's very hard. Even you and I have a difficulty reporting sometimes on people that we're a fan of. You know, it, it, it's not comfortable. I'm going to have to meet this person again in public. Um and you know, I, that's that's the least favorite part of my job is uh, to, to to do that type of reporting. At the GAFCON just recently in Rwanda, uh, I had a little bad moment when a, a, a Nigerian bishop came up to me and uh, said, "Oh, I'm Bishop Augustine in Uigbe, and I'm the the one that you were talking about who's into the prosperity gospel." And, you know, it's like, oh, I really don't want to have an argument on the floor of GAFCON <laughs> about the prosperity gospel. But he was very pleasant. And That's great. Bygones but bygones. And we were mm -hmm. treated each other at Christian fellowship. But, Good. yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to call out these things. Um, the, uh, the gospel for this Sunday is the, you know, if you have a problem with your brother, take it to him privately, then bring two friends and take it to the church and, if he doesn't follow you, follow the guidings, then he's to you a Gentile and a tax collector. Um, there's a tendency whenever we write a story about somebody, oh, maybe we get this once a month, how dare you write something bad about Fred Smith? You should have first gone to him privately and say, we're going to write something about you that's bad. Uh, and, no, but we've you know, done that before. Uh, we've, you know, approached, hey, we have this, can you verify the story? Or what's your side of the story? In, in, in journalism, good journalism, you have to know there's two sides to every story. There is the he said, he said, she said, she said, he said, she said. You know, there's always two sides to a story. And uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult to get it out because of the emotions involved, the biases involved, and uh, the John, Jonathan Fletcherist. This is an untouchable person. Even if you had the story correct, you're not going to get to report it, you know, so. Crazy times. Let's move on to the news. And George, take us to India. I know you love to talk about things happening in India. And it's not just India. It's age-related. And uh, those of us who suffer on the under the presidency of the elderly Joe Biden understand that there should probably be age limits. And uh, maybe that needs to exist in India as well. But during the story, I want you to think of a, a different reason. If I were in power, and the only thing keeping me from staying in power was my age, and I like my job, I would try to extend that rule so that it did not apply to me, George. The moderator of the Church of South India is a man named Dharmaraj Rasalam. We've reported him on, about him on the past because he's under active criminal investigation for selling admission places at a church of South India-owned medical college. 
And so that case, Indian criminal cases, take years and years and years and years. Well, this past January, the CSI, Church of South India Synod, met, and they passed a constitutional amendment raising the retirement age from 67 to 70. Bishop uh, Rasalam is 66, and he turned 60. Uh, he was 60. He turned 67 this May, and because they raised the age limit, he was eligible to run for another term as moderator, and so he was elected. Well, the Constitution of South India says that to change the Constitution, you need two-thirds of the members of Synod voting in favor and two-thirds of the diocesan councils. And Bishop Rasalam fiddled that a bit. Instead of getting two-thirds of the diocesan councils, he got two-thirds of the bishops to sign off. Now, a lay group that's been trying to reform the Church of South India filed a legal challenge. And this past week, the court, the high court in Madras, or Chennai, in South India, heard the case and said, no, nope. they did not ask the diocesan councils. They only asked the bishops. Therefore, all the constitutional changes uh, passed in the Synod in uh, January are void. And the moderator is hereby out of a job because he's past the age of mandatory retirement. Now, a cynic would say that Bishop Rasalam wanted to keep his job because uh, the longer you remain in power, the easier it is to fight off criminal accusations. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's being a bishop in South India is a money-making enterprise for you and your family. And if he loses that position, he's basically, his income's gone. You, your family, and people who want to keep you in power. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've talked about this before, and I'm not accusing people of being evil. I'm accusing this is a culture. This mm -hmm. is the Indian culture. We see this where um, it's just how we do it. People are always mad at Chinese businesses because they'll copy an American product, make it a little bit better, and sell it cheaper. They, it's, they did nothing except copy it and we're all mad well, that's just our culture you had something i did i mean i did it cheaper i made it cheaper uh and it, it that's just the way they're raised in in india they're raised to understand and they don't think of it as corruption they're surprised to hear what what this what do you mean is corruption my, my uncle and my my nephew and my family just happen to work for me in government it it, it is what it is you know so so yeah. it's uh so we've we're, so a uh, this is actually the importance to me isn't that there's another corrupt Indian bishop that spit the dust. It's rather mm -hmm. that the lay people in India have had their first real victory against the unchecked, unfettered, unchecked power of corrupt bishops. Pakistan, India, our two churches, Tanzania is another, where the bishops really are. A good number of them are dirty, from our and on financial sense. Yeah, and there are lay people who are standing and fighting the good fight to hold these people to account, and here they've won a battle. And I think yeah. this is a wonderful thing that would, I think, hopefully lead to a sea change in the culture of the Indian Church. Which it may take generations, but yeah, that is our hope and our prayer is that they can be one day be accountable enough to join the AC or join GAFCON uh, and uh, have a fruitful ministry there. We'll see. You can never tell. George, we got a couple more stories here. Uh, I think we skipped the Justin Welby story. Let's talk it. Um, he took a swipe at market economies and capitalism. He, We've always said that Pope wants to be uh, uh, an Anglican. Justin Welby wants to be a commie, as best I can tell. Well, Justin gave a speech to the British Irish Association where he talked about the problems besetting British culture, Irish culture, Western culture. And as he went through down all the lists of everything, he finally came down to it's all the fault of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and the market economy. Uh, the market economy uh, didn't work. And he pointed to the financial collapse of 2008. And what will work and the current 
economic world problems. And he said, what will work is if we have a guided, managed economy where the state takes the leading role, because, of course, the state is more moral, I think, is yeah. in his assumption, <laughs> the than the state businessman. state cares for you, yes. You know, and that's, so, that's the, I mean, oh, real quick here, the biggest slave, liberal failing is to think the state cares. Go on. So this isn't a shocker in the sense that we all knew Justin was a uh, uh, sandal-wearing, weird beard, commie, pinko. Uh, but to be so bold as to say the problems of the current generation, we can lay at the feet of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and their economic policies. It's actually Margaret Thatcher that brought in England out at the Britain out of the 70s, you know, strike a day. Uh, business. Uh, it, it, the unions had such control over England and the UK in the s late 60s and 70s. They shut the economy down so many times. And it was Thatcher who said, no more. Stop it. And she put in in place uh, uh, incentives so they would not do it again. And it no, it's the British economy. British Rail was terrible. British Leyland was dreadful. Uh, mm -hmm. I had an MG at one time, so I can tell you the uh, <laughs> uh, we called Lucas the Lucas Electric System. <laughs> Lucas was the Prince of Darkness when you had that your car. Uh, I'm joking, of course, but um, but that doesn't mean Virgin Rail or is any better. Uh, that the rail service is dreadful, but it's not because it's at the free market. It's because that the government heavy-handed regulation and the mm -hmm. bureaucracy. It's not a free market system in England. It's a guided, managed, Welby has what he wants right now, a guided government managed system. Look at the National Health Service and ask, you know, how many years you have to wait to get this necessary surgery. America's system is pretty poor, but you're going to get treated pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, no matter no matter how much or how little money you have, you just may go into debt for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's it. You'll you'll carry debt for the rest of your life, but you can get treated here. Um, one of the interesting things in all of this is comparing economies. I sent you an article and video that talked about how Mississippi has a better GDP than England now this year. Mississippi it, for. Uh, we have a worldwide audience, George, and you're from the South. Tell us a little bit about Mississippi. <laughs> Whenever we would do government rankings of, you know, the, you know, Florida is 48th in the nation out of 50 states in public mm -hmm. education. We always had Mississippi, who would be dead last in every category. Mm -hmm. Income, educational standards, health. I mean, Mississippi was has always been the poorest the most backward, the least, you know, Mississippi is whatever. Yeah. Mississippi's uh, now has a higher per capita income than Britain does. Because, and GDP, 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 gross demand, yeah. uh, gross, you know, it, and that's Mississippi has the lowest GDP in the United States, but that now lowest GDP in the United States is greater than Britain's. Wow. Um, one of the, Mississippi's recent government, you know, slashed its welfare rolls by two thirds uh, recently uh, over the past few years because they required people to work for welfare. You just didn't get it because you didn't have a job. Well, if you don't have a job, we've got some uh, ditches to dig and uh, some uh, uh, cotton to pick. And, you know, the state gave we you We will work. find something for you to do. Absolutely. Because and we know people work. decided. Yeah. People decided I would rather get a job at McDonald's than have to dig ditches for the state of Mississippi, yeah. and the and people's income rose, and the economy has been booming in Mississippi, and when the economy booms in Mississippi, you know that it's that's not a story that I think I've ever said. The economy booming in Mississippi. Now, the state's got a lot of problems still. The water supply is dreadful, and the health system is horrible, and so all that. But the path that is England has followed has led it to now basically to be at a place lower than Mississippi. It's not a boast I would want to make if I were English. 
Well, I don't live in England. I don't live in the UK. My opinions are as a colonist. But my opinions are that, you know, after Brexit, some people threw some monkey wrenches in, in the system and, and tried to break it. My opinion is uh, certainly, you know, Brexit was a uh, going to help you until you found that all your conservatives are actually liberals. Yeah, your conservative party in uh, the UK is full of liberals and Democrats, and uh, they don't re represent any of the conservative ideas we have here in America, George. No, it was the conservative parties uh, that pushed gay marriage. Um, it, we cannot make a one-to-one -one comparison between American conservative politicians and British conservative politicians. Now, there's a huge crop within both who are venal and mediocre and just, you know, yes. in it for themselves. <laughs> yes. But the ideological underpinnings that once lined up back in the Reagan-Thatcher era mm -hmm. have far, far uh, diverged. Oh. So let's find another story we can talk about. See, I mixed up here. We, we went out of order. We did Stuart. We did Justin. We did uh, India. We did Soul Survivor. Uh, Pakistani shooting? Yeah, let's do Pakistani, and then we'll follow up with uh, uh, some Orthodox news. So let's go up here. Um, there is a priest who was shot because he recited the Nicene Creed, George we reported last few weeks about the uh, riots, sectarian riots in Faisalabad in eastern Punjab province in Pakistan, where several dozen churches and several hundred homes were burned and Christians had to flee the town. Well, though the persecution has not let up, and in fact, in some cases, it's getting worse because it's getting the one on one Christian persecution. Uh, a pastor, Eliezer Sindhu, who goes by the nickname of Vicky, had some uh, Muslim uh, slogans painted on his church wall, graffiti. Graffiti, yeah. And he had the graffiti removed. And this man came up to him and demanded that he recite the Shahada, which, or the Kalma, which is the Islamic uh, statement, there is no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And uh, Vicky, Pastor Vicky, instead of saying that, recited the Nicene Creed. And the man took out a gun and shot him point blank. Uh, fortunately, uh, Vicky survived the attack, uh, and the police have allowed the graffiti to, be, graffiti to be wiped off, so no blasphemy charges here. But the instability in Pakistan is getting worse, and the persecution of Christians is growing hotter and hotter. And we're seeing a lot of cases of young Christian girls who are being kidnapped and, for, and, and Hindu girls being kidnapped and forcibly converted to Islam by older men who want to marry them. And the government and the police do nothing. Um, Christians murdered, uh, Christians imprisoned for fake blasphemy charges. Uh, it's a bad situation. It's a bad situation in, in Pakistan, and we really do need to hold up those people in prayer. No, it's it's first century level. Uh, but but think know. of it. But but think of the heroics, Kevin. Of here, you're a pastor of a church in a town that has just suffered a pogrom, where other Christian churches have been destroyed, and yours is a bit bigger, and it's a little probably more uh, solidly built. And you know that there's a big target on your back that because you're the Christian pastor and you're publicly in the street, the crowded street demanded to prof you know, profess Islam and instead you, you recite the creed, Nicene Creed. What bravery. I mean, that is you know, the, the stuff of martyrdom. That is the stuff of faithfulness um, that so few Christians these days in the West would do. How many of us, you know, close our eyes to um, the transgender issue, all these political, the, the abortions issues, all these things where we don't want to be in, uh, impolite. We don't want to make waves and we just sort of close our eyes to the evil around us. And here's Pastor Vicky faced with essentially a life or death choice. 
and he chose Christ, and that was the choice of death, and fortunately he survived. When history looks back on the 21st century, it's, it's going to be called the Age of Martyrs. You know, this is the time when there's Chinese martyrs, there's uh, martyrs in Pakistan and India and other places around the world. Nigeria and Sudan. Yeah. And... yeah. But just like human history, all of American history, no martyrs here. You know, no, no martyrs in England anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would want to be from a nation of martyrs rather than the West any day of the week. Let's see well, here. Except I, I'm well, a I coward would, too. So, I you would, know. <laughs> I would, I would also say, but there are martyrs in the West. They're just not martyrs to death. They're martyrs to political correctness That's and right. to uh, free speech and to the martyrs of, you know, the, we've had these stories about these people silently praying, opposing. What was the lady you interviewed? Uh, Victoria. The, who, yeah. uh, who was uh, arrested for praying silently outside of an abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. um, that her prayers were somehow causing distress to people. Uh, though not like Pastor Vicky type martyrs, they're still being attacked for their faith. Um, and I just wish more of us were as strong as Pastor Vicky and the woman in England and, and the people in the United States who stand fast for their faith. Yeah, indeed. All right, last story. We're going to go and talk about the Orthodox, one of our favorite topics. Um, favorite because they claim to be an unbroken unified church and you know clearly it's not my definition of unbroken and unified um and it's interesting to see the defense of that but at, this shows infamy comes from reporting on a broken church globally including the orthodox and we have bartholomew out there uh saying hey let's let's get the band together and and talk out some of our issues george bartholomew is the ecumenical patriarch he's the first among equals akin mm -hmm. and more closely to welby than to the arch yeah, than absolutely. to the pope yeah. and of course bartholomew is on opposite sides from the russians Kirill and company over the ukraine and a bunch of stuff well, on September 1st, Bartholomew gave a sermon, and he denounced uh, the Patriarchate of Moscow, and I'll quote now, for trying to justify an unjustifiable, unholy, unprovoked, diabolical war against a sovereign and independent country. And then he went on to attack the Russian Orthodox Church for disrupting the Orthodox world by being, essentially by being jackasses. And has, and has called uh, the Orthodox primates and prelates to gather together and sort out these things. But what he is taking off the table at any meeting is a question of whether or not the Orthodox Church of the Ukraine should be independent. He says, that's already been decided. We're not going to dis discuss that. But we're going to discuss the problem of Russia. Now, I very much doubt Russia would show up at anything where it's already been told that your big issue that the Ukraine is illegitimately broken away from you is off the table and we're all gonna talk about what bad people you are. But uh, I sometimes love the Orthodox just because we Anglicans fight, but when the Orthodox fight, they really fight. I mean, they are <laughs> over words. the top in their <laughs> language. <laughs> they, you know, they get in fist fights at the Church uh -huh. of the Holy Sepulcher, or go, who gets to do this? Anglicans just don't have the pizzazz that an Orthodox fight has. No. No. Oh. And you're right about that. I mean, you are, when you're calling people together, setting terms that uh, are going to make people not want to attend. Uh, when you want to attend, you want to hold open arms to all your brothers in Christ and, uh, you know, put these on the agenda, these topics. So, I don't know. It's it's not my axe to grind. My fight my fight is for Christ and his church, not his polities. All right. Have we done enough here? I think we got all the stories. I don't think we missed anything. If we did, we'll hit them Tuesday. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode eight hundred and twenty of Anglican on the Script.